Lord Jesus, we come to this place on the first day of the week to remember that you're alive, that you rose from the dead to be our Savior, to be our Lord, to be our friend. But we come to this place to acknowledge the truth that of all the things we need, we need you most of all. So meet us here. Meet us here in this experience of worship. Meet us through your word, through songs of faith, quiet moments of prayer, the challenge to follow you. Meet us through Christian friends who are here to love and encourage and support us. And most of all, meet us through the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit as you touch and transform our lives. Give me Jesus. That's our prayer for this hour and all that's within it. Well, welcome to Sunday at St. Andrews. It's good to have you here today to be a part of our worship service. We especially want to welcome our guests. If you're a guest, take the green sheet that you find in your bulletin. Fill it out to let us know you a little bit better. And uh, leave that on the pew or put it in the offering plate. And you'll give us a chance to thank you for being a part of our family today. Church family, remember that uh, this is also your way to share prayer concerns with our staff and our prayer ministry, and also to make your reservation for Wednesday supper. We hope you're doing that. A number of you have made permanent reservations, and you can do that if you believe you'll be there every Wednesday. Therefore, we use the word permanent to describe the reservation. But um, be a part of our Wednesday family. We are enjoying our study, our fellowship time, and being around the table and just sharing life with each other. Speaking of sharing the good things of life, there are some special opportunities that you have right now to share, to promote the cause of Christ and to help people in need. We continue to uh, receive our Annie Armstrong Easter offering and global mission offerings for North American missions. Our goal for our church is $10,000. and We hope that you'll be a part of sharing the gospel all across North America through that offering. We also have a means for you to help people of the Ukraine who are so in need of relief supplies. I think last Sunday you gave about $4,000 to uh, the folks of Ukraine, which is a wonderful, generous outpouring. But if you have not yet had the chance to give, do so, so that we can distribute relief supplies through our missionaries who are already on the ground there and they'll share your gifts in the spirit of Christ and as a witness to our faith and uh, our loving support of them in this time of crisis in their land. These are exciting days for our family. Um, this week we're believing that we will have a fifth grandchild. That's pretty good. Others are to that point, too. But I woke up this morning thinking how different life is when you believe new life is coming. I hope as you worship today, you'll look for new life as God speaks to you and touches your heart. Let's worship him together.
morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Are we all good? Everybody's good? Well, I thought we would do something a little bit different today. I thought we would play a game. Are y'all up for playing a game? Fantastic. Now this game's going to require that you have to move. So, you ready? Here we go. I want everybody up here. I don't need anybody on the steps. And plus, they all want to see you anyway. They don't really want to see me. Come on, Jules, come up here with me. Okay, now, everybody, y'all just face me. We're gonna do a little game of follow the leader. Do y'all know how to do this? Everybody knows how to play follow the leader? Do y'all know how to play follow the leader? Yes. So you copy me, right? I'm gonna start off easy. You put your hands on your hips, hands on your head, touch your nose, can you pat your head? Can you rub your stomach while you're patting? Oh my gosh, y'all are good. Okay, can we stand on one foot while we're patting our head and rubbing our stomachs? Wow, can you switch feet? Oh, y'all are good, y'all are good. Can we hop? Oh, there we go. Can we switch feet? Oh my goodness, y'all are fantastic at this. Here, come have a seat. Y'all are so good. I couldn't stomp anybody, man. Well, in my whole game of following the leader, now I gotta find a spot, jeez. Okay, so, y'all are really good at following me as your leader. Do you know who else we need to be following? God, thank you very much. Now, but God has a command for us, it's in Leviticus. Anybody wanna take a wild guess where Leviticus is? Is that in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Old Testament, yes. And he says, he said, say to the people, he said, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Does anybody have any idea what it means to be holy? What, what does holy mean? Does anybody know? I mean, we talk about a holy God, don't we? Or the holy Bible, right? But what in the world does the word holy mean? Does anybody know? Well, I'm gonna tell you. It means to be pure or to be set apart. Is there anybody like God? Is, no, nobody's like God. Is there anything bad about God or evil? No, God is pure, right? Now, I have a question. Is there anything bad about us? Yes, <laughs> that's what it's called sin, right? Oh, yeah, 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 I mean, you were talking about, I'm sure your mama wants your room clean, right? But your room's not clean, is it? No, yeah. So that's kind of like disobeying your mama. That would be something bad, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we think about it, but God's telling us to be like him. Can we be like him exactly? No, but what? He gave us Jesus, right? Jesus is who forgives our sins. Now, Y'all did a great job of copying me, but what are some things, that, how do we know how to copy God? What did he give us so we know what he wants us to do? Do you know? Can I give you a hint? What did he give us? The Bible. You guys are so smart. Yes, he gave us the Bible, right? Because it tells us how he wants us to live. Now, set apart. He wants us to be set apart, too. And what that means is he wants other people to look at how we're living and know there's something different. So how we treat others, the things we say, right, what we do, it's not so much that we're walking around going, hey, look at me, I'm a Christian, or hey, look at me, I'm following God, but it's what? How we live our lives every day. So that's what God wants us to do. Now, we're going to pray this morning and ask God to help us to follow him. But let's also remember that what, he helps us, right? He doesn't expect it's us to do it all by ourselves, but we've gotta pay attention to him. Just like you guys were paying attention to me when we were playing a game, we've got to pay attention to God so that we know what he wants us to do, all right? Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you gave us your son Jesus and that you gave us the Bible so that we know how to follow you. Lord, help us to pay attention to you so that we can be holy just like you are holy. In your name we pray, amen.
Good morning, St. Andrews. My name is Philip Diekman, and I'm a part of the Discovery team. But before I get started with our update, I want to give you an update on the other matter at hand. My wife, Marie, has not given birth yet to the baby, to the new, our new number three. Um, if she had, this update would primarily consist of pictures of the new baby and nothing else. So maybe next week, do you let me get up here and, and share some pictures? Uh, but to, for this week, I'm going to give you a, an update on the discovery team, the discovery process, and, and, and what we've got, got in store. So I, not too long ago, I was reorganizing and cleaning out my garage. And after many, 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 many days and many, many hours of hard, tedious work, my beloved wife came out to give an inspection and assessment of the process. And she summed it up in one sentence and said, this place looks like a disaster. And that stung a little bit because it was as if I had accomplished nothing with my many, 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 many days of hard work. And, but it was not an untrue statement. And oftentimes when we're busy, hard at work, trying to accomplish things, Oftentimes things feel a bit disheveled, a bit disorganized, progress is difficult to see. But then something happens and eventually piece by piece things start to come together. And I am proud to announce today that we can park at least one car in our garage. So there has been progress made. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, but to be honest with you, uh, the discovery process and the discovery team has sometimes felt a little bit more like the start of a garage reorganization project than a spiritual journey. You know, we all have been praying from day one to have a road to Damascus moment where we walk out of the sanctuary one morning, God's in the billboard business, and there's a giant billboard right outside the sanctuary, and it tells us exactly what we're supposed to do. That hasn't happened yet. May happen today. Keep praying, but that has not been God's plan to this point. He's had to prepare us for the calling that he has placed before us. You know, the Israelites, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. Now, fortunately, I do not think we're on that same timeline, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. But we don't know what God's timeline is. But what we do know is our next step in this discovery process and the journey that our church is taking and that next step is on May 15th. So on Sunday, May 15th at 9 a.m. here in the sanctuary, the discovery team is going to present the vision that has been given from God for St. Andrew's Baptist Church. So during, this, during the Sunday school hour, we're, I can't think of a better time for us to come together, unite as one in this holy place as we see the vision that God has for us. I still remember the phone call that I got from Al Walker uh, asking the question of the need for the believers of St. Andrew's Baptist Church to see if we are, were willing to trust God and listen to God for what he had in store for us, whatever that meant. That phone call came the second week of August. Now, May 15th will mark the 40th week since those phone calls started coming. So while God has not had us wander in the desert for 40 years, his timing has laid out a path of 40 weeks, and that will culminate on May 15th. So in honor of that spiritual journey that we're on, the discovery team is asking that the church enter into a 40 days of prayer to honor the, that, that timeline, the timing of God. And what this will be is we'll, we will be starting this process on April 3rd, leading up to that May 15th date. We'll be sharing uh, books, guides, prayers by email. We'll be working with your Sunday school leaders to, 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 to help through this process, to guide, to pray, to listen as we praise God's timing throughout this entire journey. Several months ago, I stood up here when we first kicked this thing off, and I told you how excited I was 
about to be a part of the discovery team and what it meant for our church. And I have to admit now that I believe my statements were a bit short-sighted and maybe even a little bit selfish because I'm still excited to be a part of the discovery team, but what I've learned and what have been opened to my eyes over these past few months is that what we're talking about here and what's happening here is greater than our church. We're talking about God's kingdom. And that, that is beyond what any expectation that I had coming into this process. And so let me say again, I am still excited about the discovery team process. But, and I'm more excited about working with each of us to discover God's calling for our lives and how we can grow his kingdom and spread his love. So I'm still excited, and I hope you are too. Thank you. Let us pray. Father, on this first day of spring, as we see the renewal of life around us, just as flowers burst forth, may our hearts, our love for you, and our commitment to you burst forth. Renew our desire for a deeper prayer life. Renew our willingness to give you our tithes and offerings. Father, use these and bless these gifts to bring your hope and, and your love to all who are in need. Bless us so that we can use the talents and abilities you've given each of us to be the salt and light in a world that is so desperately in need of knowing you and of following you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Aren't you glad Mary Christie didn't ask the whole church to join her in that game? <laughs> I was sitting there thinking, that's a great, great blessing. Uh, another blessing, this time of year is my favorite sports time of year, the NCAA basketball tournament. And uh, Dr. Bo, it did my heart great good to see your granddaughter sink a couple of threes in that game against Howard, and uh, I hope she'll get a chance to do even more today. But uh, it was great to see Olivia celebrated by the commentators in that game. And you weren't proud, but I was. <laughs> I invite you to look at your Bible in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew's account of this event in the ministry of Jesus is very brief, but he says a lot. Matthew 21, beginning at verse 12, we read of Jesus coming into the temple and the experience, as we usually name it, is Jesus cleansing the temple. Let's read God's word together. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. My mom left the house for her evening walk. As was her habit, she carried her trusty walking stick. It was actually the repurposed metal shaft of an old golf club. A driver, the head of which had split into many pieces years before, but she kept the handle. She never threw away anything, and it became her walking stick. What was unusual about this walk was that mom was walking alone. Most nights, her dear friend and neighbor Thelma Brock was with her, but she missed that time that night to catch up on each other's lives and unwind at the end of the day with her friend. Mrs. Brock had a conflict, family coming over to dinner that she needed to prepare for, so mom flew solo that evening. After she walked several blocks away from our home, she began to feel a strange sensation in her chest, she said. Well, believing that most of life's pains come and go if you persevere, she walked on. But that strange sensation didn't go away. It became stronger and stronger until she was in a great deal of pain. Now, these were pioneer days before Apple Watches and even cell phones. So mom decided her best option was to try to get back home and do so as quickly as possible. She struggled to get home, leaning on that old golf club handle more than usual. When she finally got there, she sat down, gave the pain in her chest a moment or two to see if it would subside, but it didn't. So she called my sister to report her symptoms. Debbie called an ambulance that rushed my mom to the hospital. Within an hour or two, she was in surgery. She was suffering from a heart attack. When the cardiac surgeon came to the waiting room to wake my sister and me up, it was middle of the night, and give us a report on mom's condition, he didn't assume that we really knew anything about what causes a heart attack, so he sketched out a rough drawing of the heart and the blood vessels that supply it with oxygen and nutrients. Then he pointed out two of those vessels and said these two coronary arteries were completely blocked. The blood your mom's heart needed couldn't get through. She was in a lot of pain because part of her heart was dying from a lack of oxygen. We bypassed those blockages by rerouting the blood through sections of artery we took from other parts of her body. 
Now the blood is flowing again. Her heart's damaged, but not to the point she can't live well. You'll have to wait a few more hours before you can see her. She's in intensive care, but she's very fortunate she was awake and that she got here so quickly. Well, my mom's coronary arteries didn't clog overnight. Decades of wonderful southern cooking. Too little aerobic exercise while raising three children and a genetic predisposition to turn fat into plaque slowly, silently worked against her. That plaque taking a little room on the sides of her blood vessels, then a little more, a little more, until finally no room was left. Her coronary arteries couldn't fulfill their purpose, and if not for God's grace and the wonders of medical science, she would have died. But she lived 20 more years after that heart attack because she and her doctors saw the need and lived with a purpose to keep those blood vessels opened. Well, as we step inside our story today, Jesus finds the vessel of God's grace blocked. Jesus walked into the temple courts to find that they were clogged to the point that they couldn't fulfill their life-giving purpose. Now, you need to remember that the temple area was a collection of courts, like concentric circles coming out from the temple building itself. It, they offer differing degrees of access to people based on your standing and your status in the religious community. You might compare it to having tickets to different sections of an auditorium or a stadium for an event. Some people can get near the stage and others are in the balcony. Well, the most sacred place in the temple, the Holy of Holies, was entered only once a year, only by the high priest, only on the Day of Atonement. He made that annual journey into the heart of the temple to offer a special sacrifice on behalf of his people, an offering that would restore their relationship to God. Only he could go there. Priests could enter the temple building and what was called the court of the priests, working in a rotation to share the duties of offering sacrifices brought to them by the people. Outside the temple, beyond that court of the priest, is what was called the court of the faithful, where Jewish men in good standing would assemble to pray and worship. Outside that court was the court of the women, the place where women were allowed to gather for prayer and worship. However, in Herod's temple, they also offered them a couple of high places where they could climb and at least see what was going on in the other parts of the temple. That's interesting. But there was one more temple court. One more area that had been set apart for God. The outermost court was called the court of the Gentiles. This was the place for everyone else. You didn't have to be Jewish or be a priest or be a man or be in good standing in the community to enter this place and open your heart to God. That part of the temple was very important because it truly made the temple a house of prayer for all people. But something had happened. The court of the Gentiles had become cluttered with other things, so much so that it could not function as a place set apart for reverent prayer and worship. Here's what happened. Two groups of businessmen had moved their merchandise into the court of the Gentiles. What a great location, right? The first was money changers. If you needed to offer a financial offering at the temple, you could only do it 
with temple currency, not your regular money. The money you used for everything else was considered unclean, especially since it was now Roman. So you had to exchange it for temple money before you could make an acceptable sacrifice. So some people made a living exchanging other forms of money for temple money, adding a hefty service fee to the transaction. They had invaded the court of the Gentiles, set up their tables, and were busy swapping money. The second group that had invaded the temple courts was the court was the people that had sacrificed animals, the people who had the animals for sacrifice, I meant to say. And so there in the court of the Gentiles, you have this variety of animals that people would purchase to make a sacrifice. Wealthier people would buy a lamb. The poor would often choose the less expensive option of a dove. So the place intended for God's purposes was filled with the noise and the smell of animals in pens and birds in cages, as well as sellers calling out to advertise their wares. When Jesus entered the temple courts, as our passage begins, he first would have walked into the court of the Gentiles. And he found it to be more like a convenience store than a place of worship. He didn't like it. He didn't accept it. And he took resolute action to change it. He overturned the money-changing tables. And I imagine right then many people falling to their knees, not to pray, but to gather up as many coins as they could find. He overturned the benches of those who were selling animals for sacrifice. Matthew says in verse 12 that Jesus drove out all who were buying and selling there. Why? Because Jesus didn't want them to make sacrifices at the temple? No. He drove them out because their commerce was blocking the arteries of God's temple. The people considered to be the furthest from God, the Gentiles, they were left with no place. They were left with no place set apart for them to pray and worship and seek God. Their place had been cluttered with the sounds and smells of the temple Walmart. As he drove the vendors out of the temple courts, Jesus said, it is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. This is the place, Jesus said, where God's life-giving grace is to flow into the heart of every person who seeks him. But you've blocked the flow. You've choked off the channel. You've let something set apart for God's work to be clogged by your commerce. So you might be wondering, what does that story have to do with me, with us, with today? We don't exchange money, unless somebody makes change in the offering plate, I guess. And we don't sell animals for sacrifice. Some people have taken the meaning and moral of this story to be that you should never buy or sell anything within a house of worship. And that's a pretty good principle to live by, unless you take it too far, like one church I know. Some members of that church came down hard on a little group of heretics. It was a group of mission friends who had baked cupcakes and wanted to sell them to support a mission offer. Well, the compromise ruling on that precedent-setting case was that they could sell their cupcakes, but only outside on the porch. They couldn't bring them in the building. Well, the meaning of what Jesus did in the temple courts that day is much bigger than selling cupcakes. When Jesus cleansed the temple, 
when he drove out everything that detracted from its purpose, he was giving every follower of his an example to follow and a calling to answer. He was giving us a call to drink from the cup of holiness. How so? We are God's temple. Paul writes to the Corinthians, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Paul says that you, as God's temple, have been given a holy purpose. God makes his presence known in this world through you. God makes his power work in this world through you. The call of Christ to drink from the cup of holiness is a call to cleanse the temple of your life, to keep it set apart from all lesser things so it can fulfill God's holy work. So here's what we're called to do. Drive out anything that blocks the presence and power of God from flowing through your life. One Sunday morning, I was ready to go to worship. I was literally walking across the floor of my office to the door when there was a knock on the door. When I opened it, thinking I was ready to go out, someone was wanting to come in. It was a friend. He said, D. Have you got a minute? And I had to confess, yeah, I've, I've got just a minute. I've got to be in the worship service, and they kind of like for me to be there when they start. He said, I don't need but a minute. And he walked in and sat down, so I figured I would too. He looked at me and said, D, I need to tell you something. And I needed to tell you today. I'm an alcoholic. I've been using alcohol for a long time to ease my pain. I know now I've been fooling myself and I've been killing myself. And I knew that I needed to come clean with God and with the people who love me. And you're one of them. So I needed you to know. We'll talk more later. That's all I need to say right now. But I had to tell you today. Well, when I left my office, I wasn't late for church. I'd already been to church. Right there. A friend I loved had realized that something had a grip on him that was keeping him from being fully alive. His addiction kept God's spirit from flowing through him to others and he knew that something needed to be driven out of his life. Now, the issues aren't always that dramatic. Many things, large and small, can build up within us and block the vessel through which God wants to flow into this broken world. Something as small as an addiction to amusement that leads us to give every free moment to the mental pacifier of an electronic device. When does that leave time for God to speak? A hobby or interest or team that we choose over God's kingdom and allow to block us from the people and the places we're called to serve. Going with the flow of a culture that's spiritually blind and morally bankrupt instead of seeking to know the mind of Christ and walk in his footsteps. And perhaps most insidious of all, an attitude of self-hatred that keeps us from believing 
that God even wants to work through people like us. If you and I want to follow Jesus and make a difference for him, we must cleanse the temple of our lives. We must drink from the cup of holiness. But if you read Paul's words closely, you'll see that holiness is not only something that must happen within each of us. Holiness is also something that must happen among us. We must drive out anything that blocks the presence and power of God from flowing through the life we share. Look again at what Paul said about being God's temple. He said, God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Holiness is not just keeping my individual nose clean. There's a dimension of holiness I can't experience without you. We must be connected to each other with bonds of love and cooperation. Holiness must happen among us as we share life in such a way that God and his love, his grace, his calling flow through us into the world. A few years ago, I saw a television interview with a member of one of the most popular rock bands of the 60s and early 70s. One of the members of that band had passed away unexpectedly from a heart attack. Their longtime loyal fans were grieving the sad fact that that group would never again take the stage in quite the same way they'd never all be together. With the interviewer wanting to explore the personal relationships the band members shared asked, well, having spent so much time together, recording, touring, and performing, do you feel as though you've lost one of your best friends? I don't think she was prepared for her guest's answer. He said, no, I don't feel as though I've lost a best friend. The four of us didn't stick together because we were best friends. We liked each other in varying degrees. And like people who spend a lot of time together, sometimes we couldn't stand each other very much. But when the moment came to make the music, the music we all loved, when we stepped on the stage to share something that mattered to us and we hoped would matter to our fans, we became a great team. We each played our part the best we knew how, and we each worked to make the others better. It was the chance to make the music that made us one. God hasn't brought us together because we're all best friends. Now, I cherish many friendships with members of this church, as I hope you do with me. But that's not what keeps us together. We're here because God has called us through the life we share, through the grace gifts we put to work to make the music. The music of his saving love. I can't make that music in all of its depth and fullness without you. And maybe you can't make it as well without me. So we must keep our connection to each other strong. We must put aside petty differences and selfish preferences and come together to make the music of witness, the music of ministry, the music of Christ. Drinking from the cup of holiness, living a holy life means not letting anything come between us that would keep us from making that music. Is God's love flowing through you unhindered? 
Or are you a blocked vessel? Does God's love flow freely through us as a people into our broken world? Or are we letting lesser things keep us from the holy work we can only accomplish together? Jesus comes to his temple today to cleanse it. Will you drink from that cup of holiness? Lord Jesus, show us. Show us those places within us, those places among us, where your grace is being blocked. We know that you're glorified when it flows and touches and transforms lives and brings hope and healing. Forgive us for getting in the way. Speak to each of us in these moments of decision and commitment and help us to take the steps today that will make us open vessels through which your love and grace can flow freely into the world. Amen. We're going to sing together hymn number 231, Breathe on Me. We believe that God speaks when we worship. Sometimes it's a compelling call that leads us to take a step, even an open public step. And if that has happened for you today, then act upon it. To place your faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, to receive the gift he came and lived and died and rose again to offer to you. To consecrate yourself, to say, you know, I I realize like I haven't in a long time that I belong to God and I need to be in a state of heart and mind that he can use me. Some things are in the way and I need to get rid of them. Maybe you need a moment to come and pray. However, God is speaking to you. Listen with your heart. Follow where he leads as we stand to sing.
Today as you go, I hope you'll know going that you have a purpose. That God has set you apart as part of his temple. A place where he wants his presence and power to be known and his love to be put into action. And if anything is in the way of that, may you lay it aside, knowing it's worthless compared to the riches of being a part of what God wants to do in his world. How will that happen? If you and I drink that cup of holiness and follow Jesus, may we drink that cup together. Thank you.